Okay, let's get started. Um, first, some reminders. Friday's midterm will be run the same way as the previous midterm. It'll be available at 10 a.m. You'll have until 2 p.m. to complete it. In most cases, there's a few special logistical exceptions for a couple of individuals. They'll have until four for a variety of documented reasons. So um, please do not have the Discord channel open between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. I'll be logged into the usual Friday Zoom link so that if at any point during the test you have a question, there's an ambiguity or something, I can immediately answer it. Um, keep your email open. If somebody finds a typo or whatever, I will immediately post on Blackboard and blast out the uh, Blackboard announcement to everyone's email. Um, also, as far as grading, I'm sorry I didn't get the uh, homework done, but I will try to work on it tonight and get caught up on all that grading. Um, although I can't promise detailed feedback on the most recent homework before the midterm, the solutions are available. Study those and, as always, ask questions if you have them. Uh, any questions for me at this point? All right, then let's review what we did last time. Last time we were saying that we can write out periodic functions as a naught over two plus the sum from n equals one to infinity of a n cosine n omega t plus b n sine omega t. That any periodic function can be written as a sum of sines and cosines that have either the same period as that function or a period that's some fraction of that period. So a frequency that's some integer multiple of that period. And this is useful on a number of levels. For starters, sometimes working with sines and cosines are easier. Um, Breaking things down into sines and cosines means breaking things down into very simple solutions to the wave equation. So that's quite practical. Um, when people are monitoring data, if they know that there's a whole bunch of background noise, then they might modify their experimental setup so that the input, the thing that's stimulating whatever physical system they're studying is periodic. And then the output, whatever signal they're trying to measure had better be periodic at the same frequency, and anything that isn't at that frequency must be background noise. There are a lot of very important physical systems like periodic arrangements of atoms, crystals, and many materials are crystalline, at least on some small scale. Even if I can't model a material as crystalline in order to study its bulk properties, if I just wanna know what the electrons are doing, if something's periodic, 100 atoms. Well, that may be worthless for understanding the mechanical strength of the material, but it's very, very, very important for understanding the energy levels of the electrons. Um, so that's why we care about this. And then we saw that a n can be written as two over the period integral from integral over one period of cosine n omega t f of t dt and bn could be written as two over the period t naught to t naught plus t sine n omega t f of t dt. And these are basically inner products, right? This is um, a n is just two times the inner product of f of t cosine n omega t. And b n is two times the inner product of f of t with sine n omega t. The reason for the two is simply that sine and cosine. Pardon? Sorry, Jeff.
The reason for the two is that sine and cosine aren't normalized functions. If they were normalized functions, then we wouldn't have that too. That's the only reason. Um, and the way to think about why is it an inner product is, well, inner products are basically higher dimensional dot products. If I wanna know the component of a vector along some particular direction, I just take the dot product of that vector with that direction and I get the component along that direction. If I wanna know the component of a function on some other function that I can represent it with, I take an inner product. Now, when we did this, we started by considering arguably the simplest function that we could. A square wave. And when we calculated the coefficients of that square wave, we took advantage of the fact that the square wave, at least the way I've written it here, is an odd function. So we can represent it with signs that have different periods. But we won't have to have any cosines in there. There are no cosines. We cross out the cosines. And that's a general fact. If a function is even, you can write it entirely in terms of signs. Sorry, cosines. If a function is even, you can write it entirely in terms of cosines because cosines are even. And if a function is odd, you can write it entirely in terms of sines because sines are odd. And this will have a lot of significance next year in quantum mechanics when you're gonna be talking about, well, if I want to change this physical system and write the quantum state in terms of these qu other quantum states, um, which ones do I need to include? And if the system is odd, then you only need odd quantum states. If the system is even, you only need even quantum states. So this goes to parity symmetry, which is a very important concept in physics that goes into the deepest realms of theoretical physics. But the only way to really understand parity symmetry is to do all the math. And before you go into the higher realms of the math, first you just need to get good at recognizing that, hey, when I do these integrals, if I multiply an even function by an even function and integrate, I can get a non-zero result. But if I multiply an even function by an odd function and integrate, I will get a zero result, no matter what those two functions are, because one's even, one's odd, the product is odd. And if I multiply an odd by an odd, the product is even, so the integral can again be non-zero. Any questions on that? Then let's take a look at what we did in Mathematica last time. When we did the square wave, first we computed the coefficient. So we found that half of them are zero and half are non-zero. And then when we summed over those coefficients, as we include more, we get a better and better approximation. But we eventually, no matter how many terms we include, we eventually run into this little spike here near the discontinuity. And a spike near a discontinuity is inevitable. Um, if you take a bunch of continuous functions and add them up, you cannot, perf well, if you take a finite number of continuous functions, you cannot faithfully represent a discontinuity. You can get pretty close, but right at the discontinuity, there will always be some problems. On the other hand, here is another function that I want to show you. This is what I call a parabolic wave. And a parabolic wave, this is a parabola, all right? This is just one minus, this is just t times one minus t, okay? So t times one minus t is a parabola. It's zero at t equals zero, and zero at t equals one. 
And then there's another parabola here. It's the same parabola, just flipped upside down and shifted. This looks almost like a sine wave. Almost like a sine wave. And if we were to calculate the coefficients, they get kind of messy, but they're written out here. Um, I just had Mathematica do the integral for me because if we were to do the integrals, we'd spend 10 minutes of class time doing integration by parts and it wouldn't show us much about, um, about Fourier series. I have it simplify them and we verify that the uh, coefficients alternate plus and minus one. Can anybody guess why a lot of these coefficients are alternating plus or minus one? Sorry, sorry, alternating zero and non-zero, zero and non-zero, my bad. Why are they alternating zero and non-zero? Well, let's look at this function carefully. In this function, this function is even about this point. Just, well, half of this function is even about this point. The entire function isn't even about this point, but half of it is even about this point. And the other half is even about this point. So what if I were to put, if I were to plot another function, um, well, it doesn't show. Let's it used to be four pi t, Dr. Swan. Oh, thank you. Okay. So let's take a look at that. If we are, we only have to do four pi times t. Let's do two pi t. Okay. Two pi t. You see how this sine wave is positive in this half of the uh, parabolic wave and negative in the other half of the parabolic wave. And then it's positive in this half of the parabolic wave and negative in that half of the parabolic wave. So the product of these two is going to be positive here and equal and opposite there. Negative here, positive equal and opposite there. It's gonna integrate to zero. Same if I do four pi t, same if I do six pi t. But on the other hand, if I just did one times pi times t, here it's positive times positive. Here it's negative times negative. All right. Because it's positive times positive, I get a non-zero integral here. I get a positive result when I integrate this part. Negative times negative is positive, so I get the same positive um, result when I integrate here. Any questions? What I want you to take away is that just by considering the symmetry of the problem, we can figure out which things are zero, things that if we only do the integrals without really thinking about them, we're just going to say, oh, well, we've got negative one plus negative one to the n. And then we'd have to think about, well, if n is even, I've got negative one to an even number, which is one plus negative one, which is zero. You should be able to do that. That is an important skill for, uh, for interpreting physics equations. But at the same time, thinking about the symmetry is another way to get at the same answer. And that's also important. In the higher realms of theoretical physics, people spend a lot of time simplifying calculations just by recognizing which things in their calculation are the product of something even and something odd that will give you um, zero when integrated. Or by re recognizing by symmetry which um, terms in an equation have to be non-zero. All right, so. Any questions on interpretation of these coefficients? All right, now 
let's see, this function is clearly continuous, unlike the square wave. The first derivative is continuous. What's the second derivative of a parabola? A constant. It's a constant. So the second derivative is going to be discontinuous. But what about the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth derivatives? What are those? They're negative. The third derivative of t squared is negative. They're non-existent. Zero, wow. They're zero. Yeah, they're all zero. All right. So we're going to have far less discontinuity. Here we have that the second derivative is going to be negative. Here it's going to be positive. That's the only discontinuity we have in here. So then I calculate all of my coefficients. I just calculate the first three, which is really just the first two non-zero coefficients. And you see what good fit we have here, even with just two coefficients. And if I go out further to get three non-zero coefficients, now these two things practically fall on top of each other. There's no way to tell that there's any difference. So sometimes Fourier series can be very, very, very accurate approximations. Other times, pretty good, but we run into problems. By the way, um, have any of you, do any, I think all of you in the 1520, well, all of you who took e lab here would have seen this. You would have had at least one experiment with oscilloscopes. Think back to when you fed square waves into oscilloscopes. Did you kind of see this phenomenon? Yeah. Real physical devices actually exhibit this. This is not just an effect of truncating the Fourier series. Truncating meaning cutting off some of the later terms. In a real physical device, all those cables that are carrying the oscillating signals, those cables don't have infinite bandwidth. Bandwidth is just a way of saying what range of frequencies can this device transmit? Those cables have finite bandwidth. They can't carry all of the frequencies, or at least they can't carry all of the frequencies with good fidelity. So they cut off high frequencies. And when they cut off high frequencies, we get this exact same phenomenon here. So it's probably not 80 coefficients. I don't know, maybe it's just like 40 because half of them are, are zero. Um, it might have looked, frankly, closer to that. And again, that is because those cables have finite bandwidth. So real physical systems exhibit the, phys the Gibbs phenomenon because real physical systems cut off Fourier coefficients. It's not just humans looking to do approximations so they don't have to carry around as many algebraic symbols. Now the next one I wanna look at is a triangular wave. And we are going to do the triangular wave by hand but look at the final result and you notice how it gets rounded there. And even if I include more coefficients, all right, now it looks good, but let's zoom in. Let's instead of looking between zero and two, let's look 0.49 and 0.51. You see how it can still never reach there? There's a point it can never reach. And even if I go out to like 100 or 50 coefficients, really. Any guesses as to why it can never reach that point? It's a point of discontinuity. Well, the function's continuous, so why are you calling it a discontinuity? 
You're right, but why? Um, <clears throat> because I remember back from Calc 1 that points, or is it cusps, corners, and one other thing are um, grounds for discontinuous functions. Functions continuous here. The limit of f, as I approach 0 0.5 from the left, the limit of f is 1. As I approach 0 0.5 from the right, the limit of f is 1. Someone else, what's this? It's not differentiable. It's not differentiable. The derivative is discontinuous there. By the way, what is the derivative of this function? Constants. Go on. Uh, positive constants and negative constants. Just... Could it maybe be this? Like a step function. Yeah, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. Something you're gonna do on next week's problem set is look at the Fourier series for this function, which we're about to work out by hand and then verify that if we take that Fourier series and take its derivative, we get this function. And that the derivative of this Fourier series is just this Fourier series, except that here I've got it alternating with period two, whereas here I've got it alternating with period one. So there's a few little tweaks in it on the homework. But does that idea make sense? Yes. Any questions on it? Then let's switch to something that I can write with. And let's start working on that Fourier series. This is the one time we're going to do a bunch of tedious integrals by hand because there are a few lessons to be learned from those integrals. All right, so we've got a function that starts at zero, goes to one, t over two. All right, it's an even function. The fact that it's an even function, what does that immediately tell us about the Fourier series? It's telling us something about the coefficients. I just said it earlier. They will be positive. Really? They'll be positive? That we're, we're actually going to get exactly the opposite result of that. All cosine. They're all cosine. no signs. That's one thing we can immediately say about this. No signs in there. All right. So also, because they're all, because it's an even function, if I were to, um, I don't have to integrate over the entire range. If, I, if they're cosines, I could say a n is two over the period integral from um, zero, from, sorry, minus t over two to plus t over two, cosine n omega t times f of t. But this is even, and this is even. So I can rewrite this as two over t integral from minus t over two to zero f of t cosine n omega t dt plus 2 over t integral from 0 t over 2 f of t cosine n omega t 
dt. What do we know about these two integrals because of the fact that the function is even? We're going to have the same values. Yep. They're the same or they're redundant or they repeat. So because they're the same, I could just rewrite all of this as two times two over t integral from zero to t over two f of t cosine n omega t. If your function is even or odd, then you don't have to integrate over the entire range. If it's neither even nor odd, then yeah, you've got to do the entire integral. But if it has this symmetry, then you only have to integrate over half the range. All right, so we know that. Now, f of t, I'm going to write f of t as time over t over two, because that is zero when t equals zero, and it's one when t equals half the period. So I finally get eight over the period squared integral from zero to t over two, t, I'm using t two different ways here, cosine n omega t dt. Any questions on how I set that up? Are you saying that you're plugging in uh, certain values for f of t? What values did you plug in and why? I didn't say anything about the values. It just plugged in the functional form. I said that because f of t is a line, it's got to be a slope multiplied by the time. And the slope is just one over big T over two. Okay. All right, now we've got to do this integral. We could do integration by parts, but let's just think about a trick for integrals that we learned earlier this semester. We have a nice opportunity to practice that trick. Does this look like the derivative of something with respect to not time, but something else? Derivative of cosine with respect to uh, n or omega. Okay, but if I take the derivative of cosine, I'm going to get minus sine. So I've got a cosine here. If I take the derivative of cosine, I get minus sine. So it can't be the derivative of cosine. This is one over n d by d omega sine n omega t. Now I could have also said one over omega d by dn. It works either way. So what I've got here is I'm gonna stick with one over n. I've got eight over n t squared d by d omega of the integral of a sine. And the integral of sine is minus cosine because the derivative of cosine is minus sine. So we need another minus one in there. And there's a one over n omega. So I get eight over n t squared d by d omega, one over n omega times minus cosine 
n omega t evaluated from zero to t over two. All right, it's getting messy. Eight over n squared t squared. Um, d by d omega of cosine zero. So I'm just flipping the uh, limits of integration around. Cosine of zero minus cosine of n omega t over two, whole thing over omega, which looks like it has a complicated dependence on omega, except let's think about this a little more. Eight over n squared t squared d by d omega of one minus, well, let's see, omega is two pi over the period. All right, so those cancel, the periods cancel, the twos cancel. What I'm left with is eight over n squared t squared d by d omega of one minus cosine of n pi over omega. And one minus cosine of n pi, well, let's see here, cosine of zero times pi is equal to one. Cosine of one times pi is negative one. Cosine of two pi is plus one. Cosine of three pi is negative one. So I can write this as negative one to the n. And then the derivative of one over omega is just minus one over omega squared. So I get minus eight over n squared t squared omega squared, one minus negative one to the n That's a lot of algebraic gymnastics. Any questions on those algebraic? Yes, Professor. When are we and aren't we allowed to plug in two pi over t for omega? Because if we do that with the bottom there, we just end up with the derivative of just a constant with respect to w or omega. Mm. Good point. Good point. I played a little fast and loose there. Now I see it. Yes, I I, I played a little dirty there. Um, we probably should have done integration by parts. Um, but the thing is that while omega, ah, you know what it is? It's that we could have rewritten t as one over omega. Sorry, t would have been two pi over omega. And so we would have always had omega times two pi over omega. And you could say, if I plug in two pi over t here, keep in mind, this is outside of the, um, this, is, this is to the left of the derivative. So this is something that happens after differentiating. This was always before the derivative, okay? The slash here is not meant to be a division or fraction, but this was always outside of the derivative. And the um, t in there was two pi over omega. So I'm not really cheating. I'm doing something that does fall within the rules but I grant you that it's one of the more subtle applications of the rules. It's one of those things where, yes, I'm right, but I might have to go before the judge because the cop might not see it that way. I might have to bring it all the way to a judge. 
So if you want to play it safe, maybe it is better to integrate by parts here. Any other questions? Let's simplify a little more and then I'll show you another way that people write these things. All right, omega is two pi over t. So I could write this as minus eight over n squared t squared, four pi squared over t squared, cancel, cancel, one minus negative one to the n. which is minus two over n squared pi squared times something that's equal to zero if n is even and two if n is odd. And so what I've effectively got here equals negative four over n squared pi squared if n is odd. There is a way of writing this so I don't have to put in lots of if statements. And that is to say that n is just two m plus one. Because if m is an integer, 2m is an even integer, regardless of what kind of integer m was. 2m is even, 2m plus one is odd. So finally, I could write this as minus four over 2m plus one squared pi squared. Any questions on that? One question you may be thinking is, so what does he want on the homework? Does he want one minus negative one to the n or does he want it written in this form? I'll accept either, they're equivalent. I don't really care. I'm, I'm I'm fluent in multiple dialects of math. I can handle it when my British friends say that they're going to rent a lorry so that they can move to a new apartment and carry all their furniture. I can handle it. So, you know, write it however you want. Um, one thing that might be bothering some people is the fact that this is negative. Let's think about that. Let's just draw a cosine. All right, cosine starts off positive, winds up negative, and go out to t over two. Meanwhile, the function that we're multiplying by it is this, All right? This is t over big T over two. And really, I should have had it go out to there. Anyway, if I multiply this red line by this cosine, out here in the first half when the cosine is positive, I'm multiplying the cosine by a comparatively small number. Whereas out here, I'm multiplying a negative cosine times a big number. So which is making the dominant contribution to the integrand, the positive part or the negative part?
Don't overthink it. The negative part. Yeah, the negative part. All the negative numbers get multiplied by something big. All of the positive numbers get multiplied by something small. So all of these absolutely should be negative. Now, is there anything we've left out? What about n equals zero? I've got, if I just took this all at face value, I've got minus two over n squared times zero. So if n equals zero, I've got zero over zero. God only knows what that is. We've got to check that one. We've got to do a zero directly. A zero is two over t, two over the period, times the integral over a full period of f of t dt. But since our function is even, we're just going to do half the integral and multiply by 2. So we're only going to integrate over a half period. Time over the half period, because 1 over the half period is the slope. So we're left with 8 over t squared integral from 0 to half the period of the um, slope. So t, what am I saying, of t dt. All right, that is 8 over the period squared. That's period squared over 8 because you've got the 1 half squared gives us a 1 fourth times another 1 half is a 1 eighth. We get 1 in this case. This is a common thing you always have to double check the n equals zero case because there are certain things that you can fairly do with um, the integral of cosine of t or cosine of 2t or 3t or whatever, or the cosine of 2t or 4t or 6t, even integers that you can't do with the cosine of zero t. So you always have to double check So the end result is that f of t is equal to one over two because it's a naught over two. A naught constant term is the one that gets treated special plus the sum from n equals one to infinity of, and I can write these things two different ways, minus 2 over n squared pi squared 1 minus negative 1 to the n cosine of n omega t or 1 half plus the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of negative 4 over 2n plus 1 squared pi squared cosine of 2n plus 1 omega t. Questions? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Okay, let's check that. So let's go and see what we got. Um, let me increase the magnification. Oh yeah, it's already at 200%. All right, so we had our triangle wave. Then we did eight over t squared times that integral. And indeed, Mathematica gave 
just what I said, just what we got when we did this by hand. And sure enough, it works, but it gives us an undershoot at that cusp because basically we'll never get to have the derivative equal infinity. Just like over here, the derivative is never quite minus infinity or plus infinity. Minus infinity when it drops, plus infinity when it rises. The function can get steep over here. It's pretty steep there, but it'll never get so steep that the slope is infinity. It's steep here, but it'll never get so steep that the slope is minus infinity. Any questions? By the way, this Mathematica file is available on Blackboard. So you can take it out and play with it. You can double check your work on the next problem set using it. Um, it's all there for you. If there are no questions on that, then let's talk about representing series with complex exponentials because sine and cosine are not the only ways to write out oscillating sinusoidal functions. What if I say that f of t is equal to the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of cn e to the i n omega t. Then I could take the inner product of f of t with this complex exponential e to the i m omega t. And as long as everything was real, I played a little bit fast and loose, but we shouldn't do that. What we've got here is integral from t naught to t naught plus the period of e to the minus i m omega t times the sum All right, there's an infinite number of integrals to do here. But what's the integral over one period of e to the i times n minus m, oops, omega t dt. You did this integral in Monday's assignment. It's zero everywhere except when n equals m. Yep. It's zero unless n equals m. So even though there's an infinite number of things to integrate in here, infinity minus one of them will be zero. So we only have one non-zero term. So this whole thing just becomes the integral from zero, sorry, t zero to t zero plus t of one times f of t dt. Sorry, um, my bad. One times c m dt, because we started with f of t, but then of course we wrote it so that when, um, yeah, we wrote it in terms of these. So we've got one times cm dt, which is cm 
times T evaluated from T0 to T0 plus the period, which is just CM times T0 plus the period minus T0 equals CM times the period. And that is the integral of E to the minus I M omega T F of T DT. So CM is when all the dust settles, that. And this holds even when m equals zero, because here we were explicitly going for a case where the product of these two exponentials cancels out to just a constant. So this is nicer than the other ones because you don't have any special cases to check, right? It's a much simpler thing to do. Any questions? One thing you might wonder is why does this definition just have a one over the period, whereas what we were doing before had two over the period? Well, keep in mind that cosine of n omega t is e to the i n omega t over two plus e to the minus i n omega t over two. So in the previous one, we were taking complex exponentials and dividing by two. And then we had to multiply by two when we put them in there, when we calculated the coefficients. Here, we're not dividing the complex exponentials by two, so we don't need to compensate by multiplying by two when we calculate the coefficients. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? All right, so far we've been breaking down functions into pieces, just like computing the components of a vector. Now there's another thing we can do with vectors. We can compute squared lengths. We know that for a vector with three components, that's just vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. Uh, sometimes for a harmonic oscillator, that's a kinetic energy. But for a harmonic oscillator, we want one half the squared length of the vector, one half the squared distance from the equilibrium point. And that is just one half m times x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Then of course, sometimes we want one half epsilon naught epsilon length of E squared and God's own units, we don't have epsilon naught. So that is just one half epsilon EX squared plus EY squared plus EZ squared. And this is an electromagnetic, this is an electric energy density Okay, so whenever we compute energies in some rather important cases, we wind up getting squared vectors. It would be nice if we could get something similar for integrating squared functions, because maybe I want to take not the electric field at a single point in space, but I want to compute the integral of the squared electric field over the entire volume of a system that I've trapped some light in. Right? If I'm going to do that, 
then I need something that's kind of analogous to this. And we were, know that a few weeks ago when we studied the Legendre polynomials, we found that the integral from minus one to one of C0, P0 plus C1, P1 plus C2, P2 plus C3, P3, the whole thing, absolute value squared dx. We saw that that was All right, well, now I'm going to show you that we have a similar result for Fourier series. It's called Parseval's theorem. All right, the integral over a full period one over t times the integral over a full period of absolute value of f of t squared dt is equal to the integral one over the period times the integral over a full period of a naught over two plus the sum of a n cosine n omega t plus b n sine n omega t, whole thing squared dt. All right, we're gonna get, if I take this elaborate expression and square it, I'm going to get two very different things. I'm going to get the squares of the individual terms. So I'm gonna get one over t times the integral a naught squared over four plus the sum of a, I should write the absolute, this is really the absolute value, a n squared All right, anytime you square a sum of things, you get the squares of the individual terms, plus a whole bunch of cross terms, lots and lots of cross terms. Now, what do we know about those cross terms? We know that we could have a constant multiplied by a sign or a constant multiplied by a cosine. We'll start with those two. The constant would be A naught over two. Professor, what do you mean by cross terms? Cross term just means um, let's, let's put it this way. If I've got X plus Y squared, that's X squared plus Y squared plus two X Y. That's a cross term. Okay, got it. And X plus Y plus Z squared is X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared plus two X Y plus two X Z plus two Y Z. Again, these are cross terms. And if I added up four things, then I get even more cross terms. It turns out that the number of cross terms, if I've got n things added up, it's n times n minus one over two. Because there's n possibilities for the first thing in the product, n minus one possibilities for the second thing in the product. But then I divide by two because there's some double counting. If I swap them, it's really the same thing, even though they're getting counted differently. So I divide by two to take into account that to correct for the double counting. So what's the integral over a full period of a constant times a sine or a cosine?
Anyone? Zero. Yep. So that goes away. And n omega t and m omega t, if they aren't, if n and m are different, but we're integrating over a full period, what's that integral? We used this last time. We have the cosine of n omega t and the cosine of m omega t. Different frequencies, multiply them, integrate over a full period. I don't want to redo that integral right now. Look back through your notes. Wasn't it zero? Yep, that's zero. And we'd have similar things for sine n omega t, sine m omega t. Again, sines with different frequencies, they're orthogonal functions. And we finally have sine of n omega t, sine of m omega t. And regardless of, um, of whether n and m are the same, sines and cosines are orthogonal. So all of these cross terms go to zero. And what we're left with is the integral a naught squared over four dt t naught to t naught plus t plus oh, there should be one over the period there. I'm just going to write like this, a n squared times one over t integral from t naught to t naught plus the period of oops, plus b n squared one over t integral from t naught to t naught plus the period of sine squared n omega t dt. Now we know that cos squared is one plus cosine two times whatever you're taking the cosine of, whole thing divided by two. And sine squared is one minus cosine of two times the thing you're taking the sine of, whole thing over two. And then let's see here, um, what's the integral of cosine two n omega t over a full period? Zero. And the integral of cosine again is zero. So what I'm left with is just the integral of a constant over a full period. And the integral of a constant times dt is just the period. But then I divide by the period. So I finally get, got the period times the period. So I've got one over t times t times absolute value of a naught squared over four plus one over the period times the period over two times the sum cancel, 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 cancel. And so what I'm finally left with is that the average value integrated over a full period
So that should be one to infinity. So other than these factors of one half and one fourth, this looks exactly like what we got for vectors. Okay, for vectors, the squared length just the sum of is just the sum of the squared components. Well, here instead of sum, well, here we take an integral over a full period, and that's the same as adding up the sum of the squared coefficients, which is just like the sum of the squared vector components. Any questions? Now, when you're working with sines and cosines, the constant of term is a little bit different from everything else. So you still get this different thing, but we could have also done this with um, complex exponentials. So we could have said that one over the period, integral over a full period, Now we gotta multiply the complex conjugate of F by itself. So we're going to have CN star E to the minus I N omega T. All of this multiplied by the sum whole thing dt. All right, I've got two sums multiplied by each other. And again, I get terms where m equals n. All those terms where n equals m. I'm just going to get CN star CN. And then when N equals M, these cancel. Plus a whole mess of cross terms. By which I mean lots of terms where I'm multiplying E to the minus I N, E to the plus I M, all of that with omega T. Sum over all possible m n values that are not the same. E to the i m minus n omega t c n star c m d t. So now I've got some oscillating exponential integrated over a full period. And once again, what is the integral of an oscillating exponential if the integral is taken over a full period? Zero. And then I've just got to integrate this from T zero to T zero plus the period. And I'm left with one over T sum n equals minus infinity to infinity. This is just the period which cancels that. And so at the end of the day, I am left with the sum from minus infinity to infinity. And that is just like computing the square length of a vector with infinitely many components. Questions?
Somebody must have a question. So here's what it's good for. A lot of the times when people are solving um, wave equations, particular for waves confined, bouncing back and forth in some sort of cavity or resonator, um, they will, instead of solving for the field at every point in space, they'll just break up the field into a bunch of sines and cosines with different frequencies. And usually there's only a few frequencies that dominate so they won't have to do a sum over millions of frequencies. They'll do a sum over a much smaller number of frequencies. And then the energy stored in that cavity is just the sum of the squared coefficients. It's a much easier way to do the math. They've taken a problem that originally involved continuous functions evaluated at every point in space and turned it into an algebra problem with just a small handful of coefficients might look kind of messy. It might not, on the surface, look like it carries the same physical information as a field evaluated at every point in space, but it's something that you could program into a computer because computers are pretty good at doing linear algebra. They're not so good at handling continuous functions at an infinite and uncountable number of uh, points in space. And this makes a lot of the math very, very doable. On the homework, I'm gonna ask you to consider a case where the um, field, sorry, where you multiply two different functions and then integrate. And you're going to get a formula that should look quite similar, but it should also look kind of like a dot product. And again, I want you to take away that we care about linear algebra because we can use it to represent functions as vectors in very high dimensions. And then integrating the square of a function is like computing the squared length of a vector. And multiplying two functions and integrating is like computing the dot product of two vectors. I'm not gonna try to introduce a new topic in the last two minutes. So I'll just take questions if there are any. Um, I had a question about the complex, writing the, the series in the complex way. Why is it from negative infinity to infinity as opposed to zero to infinity? Because there are negative frequencies. And the difference between, think about it this way. You can't write a sine or a cosine without having both the positive and negative frequencies. So cosine of n omega t. If I have a n cosine of n omega t, that is really a n e to the i n omega t over two plus a n e to the minus i n omega t over two. And b n sine n omega t is equal to b n e to the i n omega t over two to i, excuse me minus bn over 2i e to the minus i n omega t. So if I add these up, then what I finally get is a n minus i b n over 2 e to the i n omega t plus a n plus i b n over two e to the minus i n omega t. You need the positive and negative frequencies in order to, re in order to replicate the uh, cosines and sines that you're more used to thinking of. Does that help? Yeah, it does, thank you. Any other questions? All right, then we're done for the day. I'll have my usual office hours. Um, good luck on Friday's midterm. Thank you, Dr. Small. Thank you, Dr. Paul. You're welcome.
Any of you gentlemen have questions for me? You and James Felipe. I'm ending this.